records. Voilà. OK. Simon, hi. And thank you again for accepting to uh, give, make this interview. Actually, uh, I have so many questions, but let me start with with, uh, with Narchevan and Chulfa, because I know that you worked on it, you worked on this issue, and it's uh, it's so important for me. What uh, as a follower, as uh, as a follower, I get many information from your work, from your uh, even even social media uh, publications, uh, and the, it gives it gives me very much insight that what can happen in Karabakh and what can happen. Uh, actually, what happened in 1915 in uh, Western Armenia, then Nakhchevan, and it gives me insight about the future. Mm. And this gives, this gives. I hope it will. I watched your interview with Karnik and Garo Ghazarian. I hope it will give for the future for new generation that how can we deal uh, what is up, what is coming. Uh, so, just can can I I, I know it's hard, but. Can, how did it start in uh, Nakhchevan that the, they started and with your video also uh, that we, we see with the little video that you're talking about in Asia Times? Uh, how did it start? How the uh, Azerbaijan forces started to uh, destroy uh, this the Armenian heritage? And how can we connect this today? What's happening? Mm. Thank you for the invitation, Aris. Um, I'm glad that the topic of Nahi Javan's cultural erasure is finally getting the international attention that it deserves. Uh, however, I am uh, paying that the reason why uh, my research is getting so much exposure across the world is because of the situation in Rarabakh, uh, not just right now, but what will likely happen there over the next few years and, and decades, especially in areas that will remain under Azerbaijan's control, um, assuming there is no change in the government's or society's uh, approach to our Armenian heritage and Armenians' right to exist. In terms of what happened in Nahijavan, the way we really learned about it was this videotape made in December 2005, where the leader of North Iran's Armenian church had gone to the border with Nakhijavan, which is part of Azerbaijan. And I, I witnessed the erasure of the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery, Julfa, or Jura, as its Armenian name was. And this was not just the largest Armenian cemetery of the medieval era, this was also the world's largest field or, or collection of intricate cross stones um, in Armenian called Khachkars. And this tape um, is what shook me and so many others across the world. And that's what really prompted my research. Uh, in addition to the world silence and Armenia's muted reaction to what was going on. And so um, last year, after a decade long research, um, I co-published uh, um, a monumental piece in Hyper Allergic with uh, Yale historian Sarah Pickman, in which we document how this destruction actually started in spring 1997. Um, so there were several phases to it. Uh, much of the destruction probably was completed in uh, by 1999. Uh, but it resumed again uh, in a few phases, the last one being in December 2005, after Azerbaijan started pumping uh, oil to Western markets through the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline. So we saw a more uh, assertive and more aggressive uh, Azerbaijan uh, on an international scene that um, just months before Julfa's final erasure uh, had awarded UNESCO's chief with the Medal of Glory and, and probably given him something. Uh, uh, less glorious uh, than, than a medal as well. And, and so um, it really happened between 1997 and 2006, uh, although there were some delays with the destruction as I later found out from a 2008 report that Azerbaijan published documenting 
the the results of the destruction. It's called the Encyclopedia of Nakhchivan Monuments, and is over 500 pages and lists every monument that exists on the territory of Nakhchivan. Um, but the the goal of that was to to as it actually writes in the uh, in the book, the goal is to show that there are no Armenian monuments. Uh, of there is no there is no Armenian monuments. Even if we talk now, there are many things. For example, this you know this this payroll that uh, that, uh, that in Azerbaijan is all when they're starting to pump where their oil west in west to west and. Mm. Uh, how UNESCO is uh, responding this. Imagine these days also UNESCO is doing the same for Karabakh uh, and Ar Artsakh for they're, they're closing their eyes. And at the same time, we are seeing that UNESCO is also uh, gi giving the honor of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Pomegranate Fest, some kind of Pomegranate Festival to Azerbaijani, recognizing it as a uh, heritage. And at the same time, in social media, when I'm following you, if I, I see the same, that uh, also some Amnesty International and some others, they, they are not reporting as, 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 uh, as they have to do, uh, as, as it's rights in their, uh, in, in, what the, in, their, in their book, in their show, what they have to do. The, what I had from Amnesty International that they, uh, when we were criticizing on Twitter why he's always uh, she's no, uh, always posting about Azerbaijan, she was writing back that I can't be in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I was asking, what did you do about Nakhichewan? What did you do? It, it is not the same time actually what we're talking here. Mm -hmm. But is it just the oil uh, pumping and the money is rolling this issue that they close their eyes to the, the to Armenian uh, existence, cultural existence? Well, it's, I mean, the, the way that UNESCO has closed its eyes to the destruction of Nakhijavan um, through its top leadership, especially uh, under the former director general, generals, uh, uh, Goichor uh, uh, Matsura, and Irina Bokova, um, those two individuals were literally bought out by Azerbaijan, and that made a um, um, that made a um, large impact on the international silence. But I don't think it's the only part of it. A lot of times, when we see um, international organizations uh, act one way or another, a lot of times, you know, there are reactions to some. Um, global narratives like, you know, the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan, that was a perfect narrative um, for uh, the United States as it was invading Afghanistan uh, to show, um, you know, quote by quote savagery of the Taliban told cultural monuments. The same with destruction of the Assyrian and Yazidi and other shrines by uh, ISIS. It, it was fitting the Western narrative that they were fighting um, sub savages, and same with the, with the beheading. So we we saw international coverage of those events, um, but like yet the beheadings of Armenian civilians uh, in Karabakh that just happened weeks ago. Um, I think the Guardian was really the only major international publication that took a note. Um, and also at the same time, international organizations, like non-governmental non, non organizations rather, like Amnesty International uh, in particular, um, it's, it's a very convenient uh, methodology to have a both side approach of things where you can say, yes, both sides have done this and that, which in, sometimes it's true because there were there are also some war crimes, um, whether deliberate or not but committed by the Armenian side during this war although there was one uh, war crime, right? If we saw a video of an Azerbaijani soldier uh, killed um, while captured. Um, but what is upsetting is that Amnesty International will ignore the asymmetrical relationship of the Karabakh conflict, especially since the Erdogan regime, you know, basically uh, stood by Azerbaijan 100% and deployed uh, its uh, resources, its, its military, uh, uh, its its commanders. Um, so that I think that's the most upsetting thing is the even as some of the war crimes uh, are discussed, the asymmetrical nature uh, that uh, is is employed in in this conflict um, is oftentimes um, ignored. And 
And that's, I think that's also what differentiates, you know, that uh, the suffering of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, because, you know, there were some isolated instances of violence against Muslims, right, by, by some Armenian uh, forces, yet uh, the Turkish government compares that to the Ottoman government's intentional and systematic, systematic erasure of the very population it was supposed to protect. Um, and kind of um, equivocates that in its attempt to deny the destruction of the Armenian people by, at the hands of the Ottoman state. Um, I think we, 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 know, we, we, we see that in a continuous um, uh, way and, 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 and that's part of it. But I wouldn't say that all of the um, world uh, uh, disinterest in, in, in Armenian trauma is only a result of Azerbaijan's bribery. There, there are other forces at, at play as well. And especially with UNESCO, UNESCO is a intergovernmental organization. Um, it's not a one solid um, uh, structure. And a lot of the decisions like the intangible heritage decision that you uh, referenced earlier, those are actually made by the member states who are part of that committee. But certainly Azerbaijan having been a long-term uh, organizational donor of UNESCO, but also outright bribing out two of its uh, former leaders. I don't know if they have bribed the current one. If I have to get, guess, I would say no, um, but we don't, we don't know. We know for sure they, they bribed the, <laughs> the, the two leaders. Uh, yeah. Irina Popova received at least half a million dollars uh, through yeah. her husband. Uh, and Goyjura Mazura, he, he, uh, he, actually serves on a paid position for Azerbaijan's government. So he's even more open about, uh, you know, being on the payroll than, than Bogova. Yeah, right. Uh, it's like a consulting job for, 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 for him, uh, some kind. But anyway, in, let's go back to this uh, cultural erasure, because this mm -hmm. culture, it's, it's, it, uh, they, they're able to, when they're erasing the culture, when they're breaking, when, when we're talking about Chulfa Cemetery, when the Hachkars, when we're talking about, I'm always, sometimes I remember uh, Erzurum Garin, the, the Hachkars in, in Garin uh, region, which were more than three meter high. And uh, when it, there were 17, 18 Hachkars there in, at the beginning of uh, 1915. Now, last time that I was there in 2016, there were just three. The others were broken. And the thing is, uh, what, what the government did in the at the beginning of the village, you see a, a instruction a panel, where panel which says that okay, these these are uh, Ottoman uh, stones. It's mm. it's Hachkar, There are crosses over it, Armenian writings, but these are Ottoman stones. Now we we are hearing more morely. I start to hear that Albanian. Uh, churches, these are Albanian culture, these are not Armenian, Armenians didn't exist in this, play, in, in this place, even if they exist, it wasn't uh, culturally, they were not like this. This, mm -hmm. this erasure, it passes, it, it continues, physically they start, but it continues with, in another uh, level, I think. Is it true? I think it's a yeah interesting uh, comparison that there are parallels between, you know, what the government of Turkey uh, both on the national and sometimes on the local level has done two Armenian monuments and what was done in Nakhichevan. There are parallels and there's probably the inspiration probably comes from Turkey. Um, however, at the same time, as you mentioned, some, some uh, churches, some uh, Hajkars have remained in Turkey for whatever reason. Uh, so it's probably important to, um, you know, also differentiate um, that while during the Armenian genocide, and especially right afterwards, and restarted again in the 1950s, especially, um, and, and in later decades, the Turkish government uh, has uh, made sure that the vast majority of the Armenian heritage in, in Turkey was uh, destroyed or at least repurposed, mm -hmm. um, especially through the houses of worship that have became uh, to function as anything but sacred sites. Um, at the same time, some sites remain uh, in, in, in Turkey. You know, Turkey is, as, as you know, someone uh, born and, and raised there and worked there. It's a more complex uh, society, right? It has 
uh, uh, some decentralization as a government, uh, or although much less in recent years. It has had very progressive intellectuals uh, like Yashar um, uh, Kemal, who saved uh, in 1951 the Holy Cross Cathedral yeah. in Amarvan from being destroyed. Um, Nakhijevan is a total dictatorship uh, under Vasif Talibov, um, who is an appointee and a relative of the Aliyev regime. And so given the, the size maybe, and also the total uh, totalitarian political um, uh, regime that exists in that small region, their destruction is, is unmatched in its scale and scope and depth. Uh, um, it, it, it cannot be compared to anything that has happened in any part of the world in, in any uh, recent memory. Uh, when, when we say 28,000 monuments were destroyed in Nakhijavan, it's not an exaggeration, um, both of the numbers, but also the scale of the destruction. So we're, we're talking about 89 medieval churches that had survived up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Originally, there were 200 to 300 churches in, in, in Nakhijavan. For whatever reason, uh, uh, most of them were, were destroyed by uh, the by the time the Soviet Union collapsed. So, but the destruction that I investigated uh, is from 1997 to uh, 2006. Uh, this has included 89 surviving churches, uh, 5,840 cross stones, and over 22,000 tombstones that had, that had been documented by Argam, Argam Ivazian, uh, in, a, a researcher who, who, who frequented Nakhijevan uh, in the Soviet era, which was his birthplace and documented all those monuments. And my work uh, is not the historical appreciation of the monuments, but the, the political act of destruction that took place in from 1997 to 2006. Uh, whatever the reason for that was, and it's still unclear whether it was, you know, some justified as revenge, uh, others say, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, political calculation to make sure Armenians have never can never have claims to Nakhijevan territorial claims, which the current Armenian government and no Armenian governments have have claimed Nakhijevan. You know, a part of me feels whether it was actually sort of part of the Turkey and um, Azerbaijan warming of relations, and, and and Azerbaijan was perhaps trying to to show off to Turkey that we can do uh, uh, even better than what you have done uh, on your territory toward your minorities. And, you know, some might say it, it, it was also maybe part of Azerbaijan's frustration that in 1997, the, the peace agreement that Armenia's government uh, was negotiating did not uh, um, come to life. However, as you mentioned earlier, this Caucasian Albanian theory <clears throat> this ridiculous theory that Armenian indigenous monuments are not Armenian, but belong to Azerbaijanis through an ethnic group that went extinct, uh, you know, over a thousand years ago, uh, and Azerbaijanis arrived much, much later, their, their, their Turkoman uh, uh, ancestors arrived much, much later than that. This, this theory, yeah, it has become popular in recent years, you, you, even though it was first articulated in the 1950s. Uh, by an Azer Soviet Azerbaijani historian, it is part of the um, you know erasure process because unfortunately, even though the monuments in Nakhijevan were proclaimed Caucasian Albanian, that did not save them uh, from from destruction. However, coming back to making comparison to Turkey, you know, if Turkey wants to put out a sign. Uh, at the Erzurum, Khachkars, or even in Ani, calls the Armenian monuments anything but Armenian. Um, if that's a short-term tactic to preserve them, I personally uh, am not as outraged uh, about that form of erasure than you know when Azerbaijan completely wipes out every single stone like they did in Nakhijevan with the 28,000 okay. Armenian monuments. Can, can, uh, can I just, it reminds me of something in Turkey, like you said, like you said, the erasure is becoming a tr like a transformation. Pre it's preserving like, like they're keeping the Surkat church in Ahtamar uh, Island as a museum monument and they're giving you the right for once a year, etc. And uh, it was always in 
in, uh, at school, in, Arme in Armenian schools, in Patriarchate of Istanbul, Patriarchate, that at least we keep it. You know, the Shnork Patriarch Istanbul, when he, he was in, uh, he was uh, Patriarchate in Istanbul, uh, he, he, in his book, uh, he wrote this. I, I, it's better to keep the uh, dog that I know, to deal with the dog I know, than the, the dog uh, who is barking and I don't know what he's going to do. Uh, so, like the like you said, but but what is causing this uh, hate? Is was it the war causing this hate into the Azerbaijani government that time that they started to dis destroy erasure? Uh, and but you said that maybe we we are not clear about the political uh, mm. political situation uh, in Azerbaijan that time. But what was it? Because this is this is. This is more than hate. It, it needs a human power uh, to destroy this much uh, monuments. To to systematic, it, it needs systematic uh, manpower to destroy things. And I, of course, is there also in Azerbaijani government on international documents was there some is there some trace uh, that they did they why they did and how they did the, the during this whole fifteen years what, what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean the the question of why the monuments were destroyed, uh, as I uh, alluded earlier, it's a pretty complex question to answer. Of course, the first answer is is hatred. Um, what we what we really can say about the the monuments is how powerful they are. So they they projected power, um, and that's why you know probably both Turkey and Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, target Armenian monuments because culture is all Armenians as the indigenous peoples of, of the region have left. And so oftentimes they probably are reminders um, that in some ways this is the historical lens of, of Armenians. And Armenians obviously do the same thing, right? We were very proud in our history. And I think Georgians and Armenians in the Caucasus in the 1950s following de-Stalinization uh, and the thaw, they, they found much pride in their cultural monuments, uh, in their history and Azerbaijan as a, the third uh, uh, country in the South Caucasus did not have um, the same cultural heritage uh, as a country that was built by um, nomadic um, uh, in, uh, invaders. And you know, when Armenians say this, sometimes Azerbaijanis get offended uh, because it's, you know, saying we're indigenous and you, you're not. Uh, but, you know, some Azerbaijani scholars, especially young ones, actually they're taking pride in, in their history and saying, why are we offended when Georgians and Armenians say, you you know, you, your ancestors are not indigenous, that they were nomads. There is, it doesn't make one, it doesn't make one uh, worse than, than the other. Um, you know, everyone has a right to live in the region, no one is going anywhere, right? So when we talk about Armenian uh, indigenousness, it's, 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 it's not at the expense of, of, of denying Azerbaijani's right to, to exist. It's just, it's just history. But I think it has come to that point where, you know, monuments are, are seen in, in, in that narrative um, uh, of historical claims, historical rights and wrongs. Um, and also, to be honest, throughout much of Armenian history, when we had uh, uh, onslaughts, when we had invasions, a lot of times the first thing that was done, you know, there was a targeting of the cultural monuments as a way to terrorize Armenians into submission. Um, but this is not about terrorizing Armenians into submission. This is erasing uh, Arme the Armenian past and maybe in some ways erasing, you know, making sure that there won't be Armenian future anywhere uh, in, in Nakhichevan for sure, and maybe in, 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 even in, in, in the long term in, in the region. So it is a genocidal act, the, the way that the Armenian monuments were, were destroyed in, in, in Nakhichevan. Uh, of course, uh, Azerbaijani and Turkish officials get very upset when they hear the, the word genocide. Um, but I mean, there, there's just no other way to, to explain the, the scope and scale and the intent of wiping out an entire heritage. And then at the end saying it never existed to begin with, right? So the Turkish government doesn't say 
you know, the churches in, in Mush uh, didn't exist. They don't say the Chetzkon Cathedral complex didn't exist. Um, they, they, you know, they will have other excuses for the destruction, uh, but Azerbaijan simply says those monuments were never there to begin with. That, I, I think that comes with the, with the authoritarian regime too. Maybe they're, they're, even because uh, when I'm seeing the opposition politicians, even uh, in quotation, uh, so-called opposition uh, in Azerbaijan, they're just saying that, okay, we should erase everything that in Karabakh to insult every Armenian to remember the second this war, the second war that we win, and there is no future for Armenians. This was in the parliament that I was listening in Azerbaijani parliament. This is the so-called opposition which is proposing to uh, the government, and it's 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 terrifying, of course. Uh, but let me let me just ask as a uh, con concluding question, maybe you, in one of your pieces you were saying that the erasure, the uh, erasure cultural erasure can trigger uh, the next uh, yeah, spark, actually, uh, the next Karabakh war. Mm. Uh, how that, what, 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 was it, uh, what does it mean and how can it, uh, what do you see from now? Because I think this article was in November, but now that we are with our Russian peacekeepers and everything is going on, where every day everything is changing, but what do you think? Well, how can we? So, yeah, what I was talking about is you know positive peace, um, which is the idea in political science that peace uh, can have two forms: negative peace, negative meaning being the absence of war, um, so more like ceasefire, and positive peace is building foundations, building institutions, and and interactions um, that are going to 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 make sure that there will be. Uh, a chance of peace, and to um, and of course, you know, a lot of people predict that there could be a third round of war, maybe whether it's in five years, ten, twenty, or or, or, or thirty, and 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 to be honest, I hope there is never uh, a war. But in order to uh, achieve that, you know, there there are some serious questions. The the occupation of Hadrut region, yeah. where Azerbaijanis did not uh, live. Uh, has to end. There's absolutely no reason for Azerbaijan to keep occupying it when there's 30,000 refugees from there. And no one is asking them this question, you know, and there are churches on the outskirts of uh, the Soviet era boundaries of Karabakh that uh, passed to Azerbaijan in this war, that whether on the battle uh, or through um, the agreement that Armenia was forced into signing uh, as a result of the war that are, are, are no strategic importance to Azerbaijan, yet, um, you know, that could be part of a, a long-term uh, peace approachment to, to make sure Armenians uh, um, get to keep Dadivang, um, which where there are Russian peacekeepers right now. So maybe the, the fate there has, has a better chance. There's also a key cathedral, Tzitzerna uh, uh, which is just a few kilometers uh, outside of the Sunik border. You know, maybe there, there is a sacred site I'm not aware of that, you know, Azerbaijanis may want to have access to Sunik. So I'm not saying it, it has to be a unilateral, um, um, uh, um, uh, unilateral, yeah, Exchange. Uh, maybe there is some 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 compromise to be made for Tsitsernavank, um, which is one of the earliest Armenian cathedrals ever built um, to pass to Armenia, or because it's closer to the Armenian side, it's not close to the Karabakh side. Um, there is the Tigranagert archaeological site that was also um, uh, uh, ceded to Azerbaijan in this war, which is also a sacred site to Armenians, not only because of its antiquity, but also the churches that were built there and existed there up until the 13th century, um, one of which, um, um, you know, is the, until recently, was the only monument known of that area uh, before the archaeological findings. Um, there is also, yeah, some some important churches in uh, in the Hadrut region that, that are very sacred to Armenians. So um, I think this kind of draws back to the my research into Nakhijevan because Armenia was extremely muted in its reaction to the destruction in Nakhijevan. It was the reaction was so muted that actually 
the U.S. government thought Armenians were not being truthful that that this destruction was happening in December 2005, because I found um, a cable that was leaked through the WikiLeaks where the, the the U.S. diplomat is very confused that Armenians are talking about destruction of Julfa because the, the reaction was so muted. But I think there has been this uh, suppressed um, uh, trauma and anger uh, uh, among Armenians uh, about what happened in Nakhijevan. And if, if they see uh, you know, anything like that happen to, to some of the major sites in, in, uh, under Azerbaijani control, that, met, that, that may trigger an overreaction in, in the future. And so that's what I'm saying. You know, I, I hope um, uh, those issues will be taken into consideration. Unfortunately, the Azerbaijani government does not have a wise leader. It has kind of a, a, a dictator who, with Erdogan's support, was able to win a war. So now he completely acts like, like a punk. Uh, as opposed to uh, a, a world leader. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, the Azerbaijani opposition is sometimes, you know, even worse in its own uh, ultranationalism uh, and calling out for complete wipeout of Armenians and, and, and whatnot. So there is not much hope right now. Um, but um, I think, you know, maybe the civic society or whatever remains of it in Turkey especially given their history of being so much more open-minded and also uh, very brave Azerbaijani voices like Akram Ailisti who lives in under house arrest. People think he lives under house arrest for, for the book, but they don't realize that the, the book was actually about the Armenian heritage of Nakhijevan, recognizing its history. And the first time when he actually started having problems with the Azerbaijani government was in 1997 when he witnessed the destruction of Armenian churches in Agulis and protested it through a telegram. Um, and actually that telegram was only made public um, to outside Azerbaijan last year through, through the, my piece uh, co-author with Sarah Pickman in Hyperallergic. And so there are some voices out there that, that have prioritized preservation of monuments. And as someone who researched their destruction and from a political angle, uh, from a political scientist angle, you know, I, 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 I want to see the preservation of monuments also um, uh, as, a, as a way for positive peace in the future for, for between both Turkey and, uh, and Armenia, but also more importantly between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Yeah, hopefully we will, we hope uh, that we will going, we're going to be able to see uh, that time. And as you said, Akram is mentioned and you know, these days we, I'm, I'm also hearing from Turkey, Turkish side that okay, uh, let the, let diasporians leave the leave the demand of uh, Armenian gen genocide in U.S. in the other in the EU countries. If they uh, let, let it away, uh, give it away, uh, the demands of the recognition of the Armenian genocide, it will be more easy to open borders. Even he, he was saying one of the, uh, his speeches, uh, Erdogan. And every time I'm just thinking that, okay, these are parallel things. Uh, when I'm listening Aliyev and Erdogan, we, and Armenia is in between it. So, uh, Simon, thank you uh, for all this insightful uh, conversation. Uh, I hope it will be uh, insightful for our viewers, for our readers uh, also. Thank you, Aris. Thank you for the opportunity to, to reach to your, your viewers. And I hope among them, are progressive Turks and Azerbaijanis who will see, you know, the likes of Akram Ailisti and Yashar um, Kemal as um, as people to follow, uh, you know, yeah. instead of the nationalist leaders uh, uh, who are unfortunately have become dictators and are not good for, you know, either society or 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 for peace in the region. They are. They are there. They are. They are, they are watching us. <laughs> Thank you.